Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayek Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise and hallelujah, hallelujah. What a great and mighty God we serve, friends. I trust this finds you feeling blessed this morning, happy in Jesus, and thrilled to be in the family of God. Well, we're continuing our look into the book of Job, and today we are going to cover chapters 9 and 10. The reason for this is that we see Job answering Bildad, and we see a progression of emotion here. Now, we are emotional beings, but just because we are so doesn't mean we are supposed to act or doesn't mean that we even have a right to act upon our emotions. I mean, when we get angry, we don't kill someone. When we get jealous, we don't go take something that doesn't belong to us. And when we are in the midst of a trial or a test, we certainly aren't supposed to follow our emotions or our hearts or our feelings. But that's what we see take place here. And at the end, I want to point out something very significant. But right now, Let's look at this emotional process that Job is going to lead himself into, and possibly, most likely, without even realizing it. Now, first we see that Job is going to state his innocence. Then he is going to state his inadequacy. Next, he will state his imperfection. And then Job moves into very dangerous territory because this is where he begins to question and even accuse the Almighty for wrongdoing. And ultimately, he finishes by focusing more upon his problem than he does the God who can and will deliver him. Now, let's look at these one by one. Let's begin with Job chapter 9. And remember, Bildad has just finished speaking. And so Job replies by saying, I know it is so of a truth. In other words, I know that everything you just said is right. God does bring justice to those who sin, but I'm innocent. So there's something that we're not seeing here. And Job can't quite wrap his mind around it, but he knows the innocence of his heart. And therefore he knows that this is coming because of something else other than sin. And so he says, I'm innocent. But then he says in verse three, if he will, or if man will contend with the almighty, if he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. In other words, it doesn't matter how innocent I am. I have no argument against the Almighty. I mean, I don't even have one in a thousand chances of proving my case before him. In verse 14, he says, How much less shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him? It doesn't matter how articulate, how adequately I present my case before him. There's nothing that I can say that will be a proper defense against this judgment, against this test, this trial, although Job doesn't understand it as a test in the trial. You see, we see the big picture. We know the story that Satan is at work in trying to prove the almighty wrong, but Job doesn't know this, so he's trying to figure all of this out. In verse 20, he says, if I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. No matter how I try to present myself as perfect and blameless before the Lord, my mouth condemns me because my mouth is unpure. My, my tongue is untamed. And so even though I may say things that the Almighty disapproves of and immediately ask his forgiveness after, try to put a leash upon my tongue, the fact of the matter is I have still spoken wrongly. And for that, I'm not perfect. He continues by saying, but if I say that I am perfect, it shall prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul. I would despise my life. In other words, if I were perfect, I mean, if there was any possible way that I could be perfect and blameless before the Lord, I don't know what lies dormant in the dark corners of my soul. And Job is recognizing that he is human flesh. 
if he were to unleash the potential that lay dormant within his heart, there is a murderer within. There is a rapist within. There is a blasphemer within. But he must control these things, keeping them at bay, not allowing them to manifest themselves in his life. This is called self-control. We can allow our anger to take us to a place of murder, but we stop ourselves, we control ourselves, and we do not allow ourselves to move into that sphere, that realm of absolute, unleashed, uncontrolled anger that takes us into places of madness. And that's what Job is saying here. All of us can cross the boundaries and move into what we would consider insanity. But we live within the bounds of those moral standards that God has set before us and that keeps us from reaching such levels of insanity, of madness. Now it is at this point that Job moves into dangerous grounds. He begins to question God. In verse 22, he says, This is one thing, therefore I said it. God destroys the perfect and the wicked. Now he begins to question the justice of God. He begins to question the way God moves among men. He says he destroys the perfect and the wicked. If the scourge slays suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. These things don't make sense. Why are the righteous so persecuted, held back and pushed down, and it seems the unrighteous just have their way in the world that we live in? And friends, there's an obvious answer to that. Satan is the God of this world. So as sinful people, this is the only heaven they're ever going to see. But as the righteous, this is the only hell we're ever going to see. So man up. Be a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ and walk through this hell with your banner held high, knowing that there is nothing in this life that you're going to face, that you have faced or that you will face, that Jesus Christ, our master, our king himself did not face. Well, now, if you can see the process here, Job started at, let's say, level one, and he is slowly increasing in his complaint against the Lord. And so when we pick up chapter 10 and verse 1, Job says, look, my soul is weary of my life. I just want to die. But I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. So it's like a fountain. The more Job speaks, the more he unleashes the potential of calling God out and holding him accountable as if God were his equal and he has a right to judge God. Now what this teaches us is that we, we need to put a guard upon our mouths because oftentimes the more we speak, the more foolish becomes our talk. And that's what we see happening with Job. He says, look, I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. He should have stopped a long time ago. Well, he says in verse three, is it good unto you, O, o God, that thou shouldest oppress? that thou shouldest despise the work of thine hands and shine upon the counsel of the wicked? Now, Job better be very careful at this point because he is skating on very thin ice. Because what he's saying here is, do you find it pleasurable to oppress your children? In verse 7, he says, you know that I am not wicked, and there is none that can deliver me out of, out of your hand. In other words, you're treating me unfairly and, and I can't go to anyone else to stop this. So why don't you just put an end to this? Your hands have made me in verse eight. You fashioned me together round about, but you do destroy me. Remember, I beseech you, I beg you that you've made me as clay. Now will you kill me? Will you bring me into dust again? Look at verse 18. He says, wherefore then... Have you brought me out of the womb? Why did you create me if you were just going to kill me? Oh, that I had given up the ghost and no eye had seen me. I should have been, though, as I had not been. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. Now, again, I want to point out the danger of talk. Because what Job has done in the process of communicating his pain is he's began to focus more upon his problem than he has upon his God, the one who is faithful and true. 
And the more he talks, the more foolish he becomes. And even though this may appear to be innocent foolishness, God is going to hold him accountable for what he has said. And so what we need to learn from this is that when problems present themselves to us, it's easy for us to focus on the problem. And you know that the more we focus upon the problem, the bigger the problem becomes. And the lesson we can take from Job here is not allow ourselves to focus upon the problem, but to focus upon the Almighty who has us in his hands, who cares for us, who nurtures us and protects us. And even though it may appear to be the worst circumstance we've ever faced, he will bring us out safely on the other side. Job was right when he spoke in chapter 9, verse 1. I know, Bildad, what you say is true, but I'm innocent. I've done nothing wrong. And he should have stopped right there. And we too, friends, we have a right to recognize the problem in front of us. But we are to stop right there. And then we are to look unto the God who will deliver us and patiently ride out the storm, trusting him all the way through. Well, we're going to end there today, friends. The next time we're together, we'll hear from Zophar, the third and final friend of Job, and what he has to say about Job's situation. I pray that your journey will be blessed today. I pray that you will live in the light of the Lord Jesus, bringing him glory in all you say and all you do. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I love you, and I'll see you on the next video.